Hi, my name is Brother Ralph L. McNeil Jr. I hail from the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Arizona. I'm a past master out of Martin Luther King Jr. Lodge number 29. My presentation will be on Prince Hall Freemasonry. This lecture is dedicated to the late Brother Nelson King, who lays the trail for what many are reaping the benefits today as far as fraternal recognition. I'd like to thank Brother Al McClellan for considering me for this presentation. I also want to thank Brother Jeff Ballou for his guidance. Also, I want to thank Brother Jack Buter and Brother Ezekiel Bay for helping me with this presentation. The organization of predominantly African Americans started in 1775, with 15 civilians initiated into Lodge No. 441 under the Grand Lodge of Ireland. According to the late Brother George Draffin, these civilians were men of color. The name Prince Hall, Peter Best, Cuff Buform, John Carter, Peter Freeman, Fortin Howard, Cyrus Jonas, Prince Rees, Thomas Sanderson, Booston Singer, Boston Smith, Cato Spears, Prince Taylor, Benjamin Tiber, and Richard Tilly. The names of the initiates were as follows. As in the words of Brother George Draffin, the spelling of these names may not be correct. Sergeant John Bat was confirmed Worshipful Master. Worshipful Master Bat left the new initiates with nothing more than a dispensation to march on St. John's Day and to bury their dead. Prince Hall was the first master of African Lodge No. 1. There have been many books written on the subject of his life and Prince Hall Freemasonry. The first book on the history of Prince Hall Freemasonry was written by past Grand Master William Grimshaw of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge in Washington, D.C. His book, The Official History of Freemasonry Among Colored People in North America, was written in 1903. While his attempt was there to present some sort of history on the Prince Hall Order, his research has some glaring mistakes. His mistakes continue to haunt Prince Hall Freemasonry and also the life of our progenitor, Prince Hall. His book, The Official History of Freemasonry Among Colored People in North America, was written in 1903. While his attempt was there to present some sort of history on the Prince Hall Order, his research has some glaring mistakes. His, mis his mistakes continue to haunt Prince Hall Freemasonry and also the life of our progenitor, Prince Hall. Some researchers have put forth some great unbiased research. Those researchers are in the minority due to many Prince Hall leaders and Grand Lodges not wanting to correct Grimshaw's mistakes. They are the late brothers Charles H. Wesley, George Draffin, and Joseph A. Walks, Jr. Their research was presented to the masses back in the late 1970s but their research has fallen on deaf ears and also blind eyes. Leaders of Prince Hall affiliated masonry and those who continue to research the subject either continue to ignore the information or are plain just do not have access to it. There are many in this day and age who still have not produced correct info within their research papers and also on the Prince Hall affiliated Grand Lodge web pages. There are authors who peddle their books on the history of Prince Hall from masonry. These authors continue to either ignore the information or have a hidden agenda. They are in the majority. The majority still continues to confuse the masses. Prince Hall was born in or around the years of 1735 to 1738. There is proof and a copy of Prince Hall's death certificate on page 152 of Charles H. Wesley's Prince Hall Life and Legacy. Men like Lewis Hayden, who was an escaped slave, ended up being Grand Master for the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. John S. Rock, who is an attorney, a dentist, a doctor, and a teacher all before he died at the age of 41. should put the rest of the year 1748 as the year Prince Hall was born. However, William Grimshaw's book continues to haunt the craft and those who research it. Prince Hall continued to seek some sort of regularity for his lodge. There were always visitors who were initiated into the craft overseas. Those who worked the seas as sailors and were traveling back and forth to the British Isles. However, African Lodge Number 1 was entitled only to the parts and benefits of a regular lodge. Prince Hall conferred with many other masons of his time and decided to write the Grand Lodge of England to have his lodge's degrees recognized. Prince Hall wrote his letter on March 2, 1784 to Samuel Moody, most worshipful master of brotherly love, Lodge number 55 in London, England. Months passed since Prince Hall sent his request. In his second letter sent by Prince Hall, June 30th, 
1784, it was signed by him as Master of African Lodge No. 1. The charter was prepared under the date of September 29, 1784, but it was not delivered until three years later. A letter from Moody to Prince Hall on March 10, 1787, stated that the charter was taken from the Grand Lodge and delivered to Captain James Scott. The charter reached Boston on April 29, 1787. For men, for free men of color, this was truly a time for rejoicing. These men still had brothers who were enslaved, they could not congregate without being arrested, and most of all their degrees were recognized. African Lodge No. 1 was now African Lodge No. 459 under the rules of the Grand Lodge of England. Many had not reflected on this, but this was the first time degrees were conferred upon men of color were recognized by a foreign or mainstream obedience. Prince Hall affiliate mainstream in this day and age still seeks recognition from a mainstream counterpart, mainly the Dixie Ten, which I will discuss on the second part of my lecture. But how can we dismiss this part of history? When the charter arrived, African Lodge 459 started conferring degrees and having a presence in the African American community. However, Prince Hall used Freemasonry to propel itself into the Boston community. Prince Hall was responsible for seeking equal rights for his people. It was an opponent of the slavery and wanted more freedom for his people. Word spread like wildfire in the African American free community that Freemasonry was available for people of color. Prince Hall helped set up lodges in Philadelphia and also Rhode Island. Prince Hall held the title Right Worshipful Master for his lodge. But those who have researched him have confused that with the title of a provincial Grand Master. There are no records from the Grand Lodge of England with Prince Hall as a provincial Grand Master. Yet if you read some of the Prince Hall affiliate Grand Lodge websites, there is mention of such. African Lodge 459 was also renumbered during this time. They were now known as African Lodge number 370 in 1791. After the renumeration, Prince Hall still wrote letters to the Grand Lodge of England making sure that a line of communication was ongoing between the Grand Lodge of England and African Lodge No. 370. The Lodge was still sitting in her head tax, faithfully. In 1807, the progenitor of Prince Hall Freemasonry died at the age of 72 from consumption. Prince Hall's death was mentioned in two Boston newspapers, with that being his age of 72 years. Nero Prince then became the worship master for African Lodge No. 370. African Lodge number 370 kept plugging along, bringing in new members, and sitting in her head tax. In 1813, African Lodge number 370, note I did not state Grand Lodge, was removed from the rolls as a result of the ancients and moderns merging. She was removed with many other lodges from the United States as a result of these two Grand Lodges merging. However, the leaders of African Lodge were not aware of this action. The communication was sparse but the members still met to keep this lodge alive. A significant event happened in 1850. The first African Independent Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania organized in Philadelphia. One has to wonder why African Lodge number 370 had not strived toward the same. There were many Prince Hall affiliate writers who stated that African Grand Lodge of Massachusetts was founded in 1791, 1808, and 1827. Past Grand Master William Grinshaw stated that the Prince Hall Grand Lodge in Massachusetts was founded in 1791. African Lodge still numbered 370 and sent in taxes to the Grand Lodge of England. There are some other researchers who past and present who have stated that African Lodge, African Grand Lodge, was founded in 1808. In 1977, Charles H. Wesley presented his research stating that there was no documentation stating that this happened after Prince Hall's death. The only two jurisdictions that were up and running for men of color during, 19, during 1808 was Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. No Grand Lodges at that time. Yet, when the symbolic opening of African Grand Lodge happens in Massachusetts every so often, Rhode Island is left out and New York is represented. The late researchers, Harry Williamson of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge in New York, Harry Davis, of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Ohio, Aldous B. Cooper, out of the Most Prince Hall Grand Lodge in New Jersey, and George Crawford, out of the Most Worshipful Prince, Hall, Most Prince, Hall, Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Connecticut from the past, and Ray Coleman of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, and currently 
for the Allen Roundtree of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of D.C. stated that African Grand Lodge was founded in 1808. Seems that those who have left us we can excuse, but those who are still with us have not considered defining their walks or Wesley. In David Gray's book, Inside Prince Hall, Gray had contact with Brother Tony Pope of Australia. Pope wrote an extensive work on the subject of Prince Hall Freemasonry. It was Pope who traveled to the United Grand Lodge of England, perused the United Grand Lodge of England's archives, and confirmed that African Lodge 370 was still sent in communication, as late as 1824. So one has to wonder, with all the docs leading to no African Grand Lodge in 1808, why are we still pushing this date? One has to wonder the letter from John T. Hilton in 1824 asking for permission to confer the degrees of the Royal Arch Masonry on a few future companions. Why ask for permission if you were independent as a Grand Lodge in 1808? In 1825, two significant events happened below the Mason-Dixon line. Two lodges were chartered under dispensation six months apart. Friendship Lodge in Baltimore, Maryland, and Social Lodge in Washington, D.C. Both eventually were designated numbers, Friendship number six and Social Lodge number seven. For this to happen in the mid-1820s was a, definitely a great accomplishment. In 1827, African Grand Lodge declared her independence. This was a big step because the jurisdiction where it all started finally put forth her Declaration of Independence. From 1826, with the Morgan issue at, home, at hand, Prince Hall Masonry kept on chugging along. It was noted in the transactions of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Ohio that the Holy Royal Arch Mason degree was being conferred on black Masons in the 1830s. There is documentation that the black elite existed in Philadelphia as early as the 1820s. Most were members of the Free African Society, receiving degrees from the West Indies. The jury is still out on free blacks from Haiti who may have helped with Freemasonry Louisiana. However, the finding of Boyle Lodge in 1812 by men from the Free Island of Haiti is still being researched by Brother Ezekiel Mbe. His findings will come out of his book here in the next couple of months. Africans from West Indies were in the largest cities in the North, so the practice of Freemasonry among men of color was spreading once again. In the 1840s, lodges were springing up in New Jersey, Delaware, New York, and Maryland. Some of these lodges were under the canopy of a split that happened in Pennsylvania in 1837. They had two organizations going after members, sometimes using the same lodge numbers. With Grand Lodges sprouted in New York, many had to question their origins. Were these lodges consisting of free men from the islands, or were they free black slaves? It was dissenting among Grand Lodges in Pennsylvania. So in 1847, African Grand Lodge in Massachusetts decided to call a meeting for St. John's Day. In 1847, the Grand Master for African Grand Lodge issued an invitation for Masons from Pennsylvania and New York to observe St. John's Day. The Grand Master, John T. Hilton, well knew there was an issue between two Grand Lodges in Pennsylvania. So as a gesture of brotherly love, Brother Hilton invited these brethren to Massachusetts. Members of the New York delegation made the trip, and only one Grand Lodge from Pennsylvania made the same. The other Grand Lodge from Pennsylvania made the trip a few days later. After this meeting, it was decided to start a National Grand Lodge. Main Street Masonry had tried the same four years prior without any success. Another African-American Grand Lodge tried the same in New York three years prior. While at the session, it was asked that all delegates take this idea back to their respective jurisdictions. The two Grand Lodges from Pennsylvania decided to merge as one. There was another meeting to solidify this organization. So there were Grand Lodges starting all up and down the northeastern seaboard. These Grand Lodges were first organized, then seek membership within the National Grand Lodge. All but one, Hiram Grand Lodge of Delaware decided not to join this National Grand Lodge organization. Somehow this was the great mistake that plagued Prince Hall Freemasonry for the next 30 years. You had Grand Lodges leaving the National Grand Lodge due to her irregular setup. That setup was a Grand Master, a National Grand Master, over a Grand Master, meaning that Grand Lodges were not sovereign unto themselves. Grand Lodges were chartered left and right as a result of this phenom. During the 1850s, there were lodges leaving the National Grand Lodge to set up their own Grand Lodge. These Grand Lodges were called Independent Grand Lodges. 
There was a lease between these Grand Lodges during 1851. However, the National Grand Lodge caught on like wildfire and started chartering Grand Lodges in the 1850s and 60s. It was in these very jurisdictions that you had the same great men who served. Some were some of the more astute men of their time. Men like Lewis Hayden, who was an escaped slave, ended up being Grand Master for the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. John S. Rock, who was an attorney, a dentist, a doctor, and a teacher all before he died at the age of 41. Thomas Stringer, who was an elder on the travel circuit for the African Methodist Epis um, Episcopal Church, who traveled all up and down Canada, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, North Carolina, and all these other states. Martin R. Delaney was the first black major in the Union Army, who was a doctor and a graduate of Harvard University. And Richard Gleaves, who was the first lieutenant, who was the lieutenant governor of South Carolina, just to name a few. With the Fugitive Slave Law, Law Act of 1850, this law made it difficult for African men to meet as Masons. However, these men continued to set up lodges and grand lodges in the South. There were grand lodges south of the Mason-Dixon line in Baltimore and also D.C. Lodges as far south as Louisiana. However, lodges in the slave states were held to a trickle. But there were men of the cloth who traveled by horseback, passed on the gospel of the A.M.E. Church, and also Freemasonry. By the beginning of 1860, there were grand lodges in the northern states. There were grand lodges in Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Delaware, D.C., and Maryland, to name a few. There were also independent grand lodges in some of those same states. But there was such a rivalry between the two that whenever a lodge started, the other organization would give a lodge the same name. There was also a grand lodge started in the Deep South in Louisiana, which was organized in 1863. The Civil War opened up many opportunities for men of color. When law was passed to recruit men of color, there were many Prince Hall Freemasons who served as recruiters. The 54th and 55th regiments were started and it made basically history. The late brother Joseph Walks Jr. stated wherever the African American fought this war, he would take his Freemasonry with him. It is documented that there was a lodge attached to the 54th Regiment. It was the same regiment who were ventured into Charleston ready to burn this city down, only to have the famous Masonic researcher Albert Mackey begging this regiment not to burn down his town. After the Civil War was over, Reconstruction took over in the southern states. A record 21 Grand Lodges were started from a period of 1865 to 1871 most under the National Grand Lodge. However, a lot of these Grand Lodges were started in the Deep South. The National Grand Lodge charted these Grand Lodges and Prince Hall Freemasonry began to flourish. In 1867, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Ohio decided that she wanted to part with the National Grand Lodge. Once this happened, there was a snowball effect among Prince Hall Grand Lodges. Between 1867 to 1876, there was a total of 25 Grand Lodges that merged or left the National Grand Lodge. There were a series of meetings to try and implement some type of peace among the craft. However, the 1870s was a significant period due to Prince Hall Grand Lodges seeking their sovereignty. Reconstruction was taken away after 1877, so men of color were once again subjected to being second-class citizens. The 1880s was a growth period for Prince Hall Masonry. There was a unification of five Supreme Councils in 1881. Some were under the National Grand Lodge, however, to get everyone on the same page, two Supreme Councils came out of that meeting. Freemasonry for the African American was growing in at a steady rate in the South. Free slaves were learning how to read and write. Joining Freemasonry would teach them how to run a business and also public speaking. But Prince Hall Freemasonry would still flourish in the jurisdictions in the South and also up North. This concludes the first part of my lecture. I hope that there was some clarification as to who was Prince Hall and what is Prince Hall Freemasonry. Books used for the first part of this lecture are as follows. Black Square and Compass, 200 Years of Prince Hall Freemasonry by Joseph A. Walks, Jr. Prince Hall Life and Legacy by Charles H. Wesley. A Prince Hall Quiz Book by Joseph A. Walks, Jr. History of the United Supreme Council of Northern Jurisdiction by Joseph A. Walks, Jr. Inside Prince Hall by David Gray. Out of Shadows by Brother Alvin Roundtree. And In Search of Equality, by Brother Jack Buda.
Thank you very much for listening to my lecture, and if you have any questions, please feel free to talk to us in the chat room. Thank you very much.